और तुम कितने से टहन हो गए हो और तुम वीडियो बना रहे हो और लाइफ में काम नहीं because of having been an outsider uh, for so long i mean from 25 onwards i've been an outsider to the cities that uh, i lived in or an immigrant um, even if it was delhi it's become such an essential place now for me i'd, I'd much rather that i'll be in a place where people always think that i think differently from them because i do <laughs> so there's a comfort in kind of being the outsider. Ah, uh-huh, but because you we are out I am an outsider and and for many I'm a massive insider. It's not as if I'm a, a hugely unconventional thinker, but it's not it's definitely the inside of my life is not a geography at all. It's not a city. This city or Karachi anywhere. But in Karachi because I'm a Pakistani woman, the labels of being what it means to be a pakistani woman is so much more clear um and here to in any case people who think oh she's brown she's got she's got you know what is she they're not being able to fit me in anything i think that's a much more interesting place to be in some ways uh, and the inside of course is only a community of friends who don't necessarily apart from a few live in berlin so it's a mental space Berlin conjures up his past like no other city does. He's lived here for 11 years, but the specters that keep returning to it are from all over. So, he decides to write them into his text, making it porous, as porous as he finds the city. Writing Berlin, in his case, is stirred by resonances of multiple places, thickened by present pasts. He will one day notice similar hauntings in Emine Sevgi Özdemir's short story De Hof im Spiegel a labyrinthine entwinement of people and places something approximating post-national intimacy in the words of a translator he will find comfort in the poems of Aris Irren that chronicle in the setting of a single street now in Straße in Berlin Kreuzberg a far greater story of belonging and survival migration and arrival these will assure him that berlin is written in many languages in many different places and circulates at times far from the city itself eventually he too will come to see how he is implicated in the scenes he describes for what is the migrant's act of writing the city if not in engaging with the city as a complicated home but for now when he refers to himself in the third person not i but he he follows Kathleen Stewart's technique of gaining distance from one's own subjectivity while recording at the same time the privileges and particularities that inhere in his classed and cisgendered ways of inhabiting Berlin the texts he writes 
are not about him, though he's integral to their compositions. In a way, these act like artist Nina Kachudurian's lavatory self-portraits in the Flemish style, which are not selfies, as she claims, but other portraits of the self. When I've lived away from Pakistan, I've always lived in migrant neighborhoods. It's, it is again a way of like how, how we've negotiated all our lives, uh, sort of Pakistani dudes. That's exactly how I like, loud music, cologne, all of these things. In some ways, very, very stark, but very familiar in some ways. So the, the idea of walking down a street and the men watching. So these are not things which, of course, one would ideally say, oh, I love living in this thing, but it's also not so threatening because one, we have also learned how to negotiate. So it's a constantly a way of negotiating your environment that we've learned as people from Karachi and Pakistan, how to, as a woman. And I think that's part of the, um, yeah, it's all about familiarity, um, ultimately. He stood at the counter at Rewe asking for 100 grams of roast beef. Though he had done so in German, he had caught himself, like so many times before, Germanizing his English words. He had learned to make these little adjustments for the benefit of his listeners. He hadn't arrived at this decision consciously. It had, as if of its own will, crept into his ways of being in the city. It had often lent his German a certain kind of authenticity, the kind that comes with not pronouncing English words in any English way. So, on that day, as he stood before the counter, he asked for roast beef, when in fact he had meant roast beef. Despite his German enunciation of the word, the German man at the counter picks the wrong sort of meat, the one he hadn't asked for, as if his generous gesture of Germanizing was entirely lost on him. Disappointed, he uttered the same words again, this time pointing to the roast beef, to which the guy responded, das ist aber roast beef. This time, he just rolled his eyes, and though he did roll his eyes in English, he was confident it couldn't be lost in translation. English, he was in a kleiner bit happy. Chicken? Pakora? I mean, it's really authentic kind of stuff. We are part of the tribe that left the global south and migrated to the, to the north. And yet it is the north, for me more than you, for you, which is the source of uh, historical uh, angst and, uh, and frustration. And yet here I am, and so this is not what I should have done. This is not what I, that lives, that eats, eats you up at some point, that I should be there. Yeah. 
you're not working class migrants, so it's full of privilege, you kind of float above the um, compulsions of everyday problems because you're economically, class-wise and every way, uh, you've arrived with a space of privilege in some ways. These can't be value-based judgments about people. We, it's, it's sweet and endearing to see how we are products of where we come from. So of course these kind of comparisons hyper-normalize uh, everything in some ways or uh, you have, you're compelled to think back, to understand, think back to understand your own life and we've done that together. I mean our relationship is so much about revisiting and trying to understand what happened uh, and why we are here today and I think we would not have been ever had this conversation if we had met in Karachi and had never left Karachi. The meeting in the park, in a Berlin park, is the space of belonging. Um, and that's where we meet, you know, just like an island of people who move around here and there. And of course it's interesting because at the same time, there's a slow immersion into your Keats, into your neighborhood. And you bring back stories and thoughts and comparisons and views. <laughs> There is a woman he sees almost every day. From where he usually sits outside this cafe on the street where he lives, there is just a line of three potted plants that separate the cafe from the Speti, where she sits, sipping tea. And just now, as he's jotting down these lines, a man from across this plant line reaches out to him. Hassan from Morocco introduces himself and inquires a little bit about him too. Ich komme aus Pakistan, he says in German. In this moment, his eyes meet the eyes of the woman, but they do not exchange greetings. When Hassan asked him if he could join him at his table, the potted divide felt a lot more real to him. Mixed as it is here in this neighborhood, dog owning, breakfast eating, coffee drinking Yukis or young urban creative internationals, as the Guardian once described Berliners of Neukölln, hardly mingle with those that leisurely hang outside Spätis, speaking Arabic, Turkish, Romanian and what not. Yet certain intimacies were inevitable. For instance, on other days when looking out from this cafe, framed by its window front, he sees passers-by, possibly his neighbours, ones that are routinely caught in fleeting passages, for example, this woman dressed in shalwar kameez, 
dragging a wheeled bag of groceries. Every time he sees her, he tries to quickly piece together the finer details of the cursory scene, like the length of her chemise or the precise cut of her garment, all cues that he thinks will lead him to assess whether she might be Pakistani or Indian, possibly even Bangladeshi. He's of the conviction that Pakistanis dress better, but that's beside the point. These neighbors, he notes, never stop at cafes. They hardly peek in. They just keep walking on. Right across is another cafe, tad fancier than this one, where the coffee is 20 cents more expensive and candles in dark interiors peek out of large windows, even during the day. Tables are hard to get, especially outside, even though, unlike a Parisian cafe, there isn't much going on to gaze upon. A kinderwagen pushing mother stops by to chat with the dog owner, a scene of likely white intimacy, he thinks. Breakfasts continue, the light drizzle too. The leisure of cafes is palpably different from leisures of Ushpeti, it suddenly dawns on him. He is immediately reminded of his hatred for zucchini cakes, which so often announce the hipsterness of cafes. There's one like that on the other street, where the coffee costs 50 cents more, where ashram pants upend the outline of headscarves, vegan sandwiches frown at kebabs of the Keats. Annoyed by the thought, he returns to the scene that is now, back to where cheese platters, breakfast spreads and bread baskets stop at potted lines. So does the eclectic style of mismatching furniture. But not always are potted lines legible, he thinks. By night, on the same street, candlelit bars glimmer unlike game rooms, whose fluorescent glow outs them as men's only migrant spaces. He never goes there. لما كبرت ما بقتش أطير من كوابيسي وفي الغربة كوابيسي بتصحى معايا والأحلام هي اللي بتصحيني الأحلام هي اللي بتخليني أحس بالمكان والزمان في الغربة ساعات الحقايق بتتشبه بالأحلام والأحلام هي اللي بتدي الحقايق معانيها I mean, it's, a, it's an airport, it's a place where people come, arrive and departure. And it's in the center of the city. The interesting fact that it's an airport, but it's not an airport anymore. It's a, a residue of an airport. It's also put a, a space of potentiality. It's not functional anymore, but it's a kind of reminder that this place where people are now just hanging around, jogging or having good time in the sun. It used to be somewhere where people like travel, where people leave, maybe deported. Um, you see, they are having fun. But <laughs> and, um, and it's massive. I mean, it's not just an abandoned, it's not an abandoned villa or abandoned house or, it's massive, it's, it's huge and it's, it's huge in terms of the space, of course, it's, uh, it's too big, but also in the terms of the architecture. Uh, it, it's, it has like a sovereign presence. It's a reminder of, of the past. It, 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 it leaves like, it's like gaps from the past that are allowed to exist in the present. So it allows the past to, 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 to inhabit the present and also makes the future kind of open for infinite possibilities. And, and it's like the balcony in the way, like, you know, this idea of um, it's a potentiality to escape. Of course, it's <laughs> unattainable, but, you know, it's there and you have the potentiality that you can leave or you, you would leave. A 
lyrically buoyant circle of men has come to a still. Chants and recitations, art screams and intermittent howls are no more, but the air is pregnant with its resonances. There is a sense of nascent repose, smells of fragrant oils linger on, even if in less pungent forms, as sweat softens the contours of men's bodies, mostly men in their twenties, who until moments ago were oscillating on their feet, singing hallowed praises, swaying rhythmically left to right and back to left, their forearms locked with one another. But no more. Tired, sweaty, overcome with feelings, the men are now seated on the carpeted floor, gasping. The puff and pant of heavy breathing is fairly audible, their bodies not upright like moments ago, but curled up such that their heads almost meet the ground. Forty minutes of an intense ritual are over in a room in Neukölln, longer than it is wide and oriented obliquely towards Mecca. A five minute walk from where he lives is a mosque. He goes there every week where 25 to 30 men gather around a sheikh who leads them into zikr, the Sufi performance of mindful remembrance of Allah. In circles of godly remembrance, the men are young and Turkish German, sons of Gastarbeiters, migrant workers who arrived in Germany in the 1960s and 70s. When they sing and chant, laugh and cry, move and are moved, or simply fall to the ground, they remember and long with their bodies. Some of these men tell him that there are other persons in the circle, ones he cannot see, and that when, with their eyes shut, they sing and chant praises of saints and holy men, holy men and saints appear, intimacies take hold, even if only in passing. The experience of migration makes reality something contingent. Living in exile question what we deem as reality. So I started to think about like this, like wh wh where are the, what are the boundaries? Where are the borders between reality and dreams? And is, is that something that has to do with my uh, presence in Germany as you know, as Gharib, as uh, Muhajir, as um, in exile, basically. My relation to home is based on imagination. If I'm not living home, so the, the, the potential of of imagining home uh, is, is so important to me. It's and also like remembering home. And I'm aware that when I say like remembering home, it's not about like remembering facts. Trying to recall certain certain encounters, even even certain things you lived already, but remembering them, what you recall are different images. So I felt like this is like everything I have from home and I need to keep it. So it was important like to, to activate this sense of imagination. It became essential. Theorizing migration by way of the intimate bolsters his argument that intimacy, barely a singular situation, is in itself an unfolding. It is a historical elaboration, so to speak. Scenes of daily loves, sexual or otherwise, are invariably, if not also unwittingly, folded up with concerns that are principally in excess to situations that transpire in the present or play out in front of our eyes. Elaboration means that we remain affectively attached also to that what takes form after the fact of coming close or makes itself known by way of its longing. 
Writing is one longing, an aching for one's own histories to gather, stick, and sediment in new places through the labor of memory. He remembers through writing that what feels distant now, possibly dismembered. The post-migrant city, like the migrant sense of time, is compound, interrupted at times, at times stretched. It is a porous geography of disparate times and momentums, conflicting memories and motivations, the now and the not yet, the here and the also here. To belong, he thinks, is to be with longing. It is the migrant feeling for an expansive sense of being in time and in space. To remember, then, is not simply to reminisce a past. It is a gathering anew in migration, that what feels remote or removed, possibly at risk of loss. It is a path to feeling futures. Even in my childhood, like I see ghosts or uh, monsters or something bad happen, then um, there's this moment of realization inside the dream that this is a dream, it's not real. And then what to do? I am imprisoned in, in my dream. So I really, I really started to like <laughs> move my, my arms and to fly, to fly like out of the dream. And this was my way like to wake up and I was also thinking about okay it's interesting that I can afford leaving my nightmares but what about reality when reality start to be a nightmare and you are imprisoned there and you cannot go you can't go nowhere so maybe the, the refuge is to it's actually to dream you know uh, Um Kulsum. She has a, a, a song where she sings something like uh, Time doesn't matter for those who live in uh, imagination. He couldn't have known why he wished to photograph the bed. It wasn't his own, it wasn't his either. Perhaps it was the whiteness doubled by that of his lover, or its hotel-like anonymity that had struck something in him. Each morning, as they got out of the white sheets, he felt that in unmaking the bed through the night, they had made it their own. Where does one look for traces of a brown body amidst so much whiteness, he would wonder years later, as he went through the nine photographs. Intimacy in this constellation of images wasn't an abstract idea, but a concrete presence pressing upon fabric. Affect had a way of imprinting itself, not just on bodies. Some of it had found its way in the spot where the mattress sagged just a wee bit, or in the crumpled sheets willowing with ghost-like presence in the disheveled feathers full of gossip inside pillows. He wouldn't have articulated what he was feeling in these exact terms just then, but he knew as much that what he captured in a photograph each morning was all the same and yet not the same. Creases, folds, volumes of intimacy and sunlight that entered the room were all unique. Once he then would himself out crease, fold up, cover, flatten, making the bed each morning so that it could return to its anonymous white self. 
This wasn't destined to be furniture without memories, Toni Morrison's phrase that Avery Gordon repurposes to describe the effects of those rituals, habits, structures, and behaviors whose history we do not ask for, so ingrained in our ways of being that we never pause to question their purpose. This, he reckoned, was furniture with memory, imprints he knew he wanted to return to long after the queer folds of nine nights had been straightened out, morning after morning, ready, almost waiting as if for other bodies of colour to arrive, take cover in its engulfing whiteness. I wonder how much space there really is because this whole question around identity or the, the identity politics question that's flared up in Germany I think has been so highly contested, surprisingly so. I mean I'm so glad that it's actually taking place and that there is space again for this because when I first started like 20, 20 years ago or almost 20 years ago when I made my first short film or essay film about my family or my father's migration to Japan, um, around about that time people were sort of, it was like uh, almost looked down upon, like why would we care about, you know, your biography or why would we care, why should we be interested or something. For, whatchamacallit, take up shots. I, did, I wasn't prepared, I was like, are you already recording? You know, I'm still making my coffee. <laughs> um, just a minute of break, because this is the moment that you cannot miss when the coffee is coming out. Because if the coffee stays on the stove for too long, it gets bitter. You know? Sometimes when I don't pay attention, it stays on there too long. You have so much milk in your coffee! <laughs> wait, wait for it. Oops, yeah, well. I think I was talking about how the process of understanding or learning about history, um, because that's what I'm doing in, in my project, is trying to learn or understand or, or create connections or relations to um, past um, experiences. So, so our, the archival research obviously is um, a large part of my work. Um, and um, this is a book you gave me um, by Julieta Singh, No Archive Will Restore You. And um, just the way she uses um, the archive and the body and experience. Because I, I have thought about this, you know, because I mean, my parents were, they lived through World War II and my father has lots of scars on his body. And I could, I could relate to this notion that, you know, the, of the, the embodiment of pain or experience. But I like how she conceives of, um, of identity as like, a, um, like an infinity of, of you know, of parts that you can never fully understand but that you sort of have a desire to know maybe i'm improvising now and uh, but i think there's something in there that resonates with me because i feel like um the process of working on these questions at least for me um it's not a matter of you know finding out one answer or uh, one you know conclusion or anything like that it's always a, it's it's an ongoing process and i and i think that this will always be part of um, who I am. He watches the leaves fall. From where he usually sits outside this cafe on the street where he lives, the scene is pretty much the same. Breakfasts continue on both sides of the street. A woman walks past dragging a wheeled bag of groceries, another familiar scene within the scene. She, however, is not Pakistani. The wind is colder, the sun scarcer than it was just a month ago. It is only late August. He watches the leaves fall. He doesn't smell autumn, not yet. He misses Bani. When she left for Karachi less than a month ago, he couldn't really understand why someone would want to leave Berlin in the summer. Precious. He now sees it slipping away. He writes her a message on WhatsApp. He's anxious to hear what she thinks of his prologue to Thin Attachments. 
He usually bounces his ideas off her, mostly because she has an oddly superior talent of sifting through academic bullshit. She tells him she loves the title. He's now sure she hasn't read it beyond the title. He misses her even more. He watches the leaves fall. Oh, Sylvia. Sorry, it wasn't shooting. I'm so sorry. No problem. Now I have you up and down, which is nice. Gonna <laughs> <laughs> get. You know, I moved to Germany for the first time in 1993. I was turning 20 that year, so, you know, I came to Germany as an adult. And I think that the 90s, as exciting they were in Berlin, were also very difficult and a very diff different time. Um, you know, people were um, very, um, and rightfully, preoccupied with um, German identity issues about the reunification, but that also meant that we were in a completely different chapter in terms of um, otherness or, you know, that was the time when people were still, it was still very prevalent to call someone like me oriental or, you know, the Orient was a huge geographical <laughs> space in people's mind and could be anything, you know, but that was, that was the 90s. I mean, that was still, you know, uncontested back then. I only mentioned the year of arrival because I feel like I haven't arrived yet. I would say I have started arriving maybe about three or four years ago, um, which has <laughs> taken me a long time. <laughs> but um, I've been thinking about this a lot, um, you know, because it's obviously not being able to arrive in a place that's supposed to be your home and being very aware of it, it's, it's only going to make you want to go away again. उस शहर से फिर मोहब्बत करना मुश्किल है मुश्किल है उस शहर वापस जाना मुश्किल है to bring memoir to bear on geography is to consider how time binds the narration of one life to the many affective mappings of a city. In pursuing the matter of thin attachments, he points to tentative mappings as much as to shapes of relating intimately in the city that do not transact in values of density or tightness. These are intimacies that dwell in their infirmness and which even in their nursed, stretched out or temporally drawn illuminations betray what is futural in the logic of belonging or which flourish or at times only endure with little or no optimism in what Berlant calls intimacy's long middle. Thin is what survives in and of relating on a map without investing in the stability or coherence of objects that comprise those relations. It speculates less in objects that map than in affectivities and affections that make up modes of relating to those objects, whether those are acts of pursuing or disinvesting, the condition of being drawn or desiring withdrawal. I don't see myself represented yet, um, in a way, um, because it's very complicated. I mean, I could see myself represented, but I also don't, and because these questions haven't been addressed, and, you know, biracial issues are very low on the, or, or, or minor, or marginal on the whole spectrum of conversations around, around diversity. Um, it's a typical question for any biracial that they will know. You always have to check one box. And people, society wants you to check one box. They always want you to choose either by external forces because of the way you look or behave or, or even, you know, on your own accord. But they don't want you to be multiple. They want you to be one. 
But I do think that the representation, institutional representations have been extremely important. And, and there's a way of vicariously um, being happy. I, it kind of gives me a feeling of, I don't know, relief or <laughs> major relief. <laughs> Where all, all of these small, you know, small but very important symbolic um, markers, I think, is a very healthy and, and welcome um, um, development. Um, personally, uh, things have changed literally around the time I met you, because I think that I arrived, like arriving or feeling like you're, you're feeling at home in your neighborhood, in your in your Keats or in your microclimate of your everyday life, and to be able to speak about these experiences, and to have to know that there are people that you can talk to, that you, as you said, think with or you know think through these experiences with, that has really majorly sh sh shifted, um, and it's not just you, but also you know Natalia and other, and and just the fact that I feel um, that there is more cultural sensitivity or sensitivity towards these experiences makes a huge difference. Um, it allows me to feel like I can arrive. So I'm not the only one. Well, <laughs> you're a major part of You know that. I want to stop the interview now. <laughs>From the moment he opened his eyes on that Saturday morning, he knew something was amiss. Even though he had imagined it otherwise, his body had drifted away from his through the course of the night, a tad further apart than it was possible on a 140 meter wide bed. He made him coffee in the morning. They took it in the kitchen, commenting how unremarkable its taste was. When he walked out of the door, he kissed him ever so lightly on the lips touching only to untouch them again. See you soon, he said, as though it was an inadvertent speech act. He didn't believe him, not one syllable, but he knew that it was the right thing to say in that moment. Later that evening, he stood in a circle with Sufis as they sang praises of saints and holy men. He wondered, like he often did in the circle, how one could see with eyes closed. He sees you, you don't see him, we're all together, it's love, a Sufi follower had once explained to him. That night, as he closed his eyes, eyes he was told were Knopfaugen, he too saw, as Sufis would, though not a saint but him. It ought to have been love indeed. And when, at the end of the ritual, the Sheikh raised his hand in prayer, he raised his hands too. After a long time, he had caught himself praying, this time for him and him. That week, they drudgingly chatted on WhatsApp. Then on Friday, he received the breakup message. A prayer in the city had not come true.